Um, so, Professor, today we are glad to have a uh, Professor Wang Xiaomu to have a uh, give a talk here. Professor uh, Xiaomu Wang got his PhD uh, degree in the Chinese University of Hong Kong in 2012, and then he worked as a postdoc associate at the University of Cambridge and Yale Universities. So he's across in basically Asia, Europe, and uh, US. A lot of experiences. Uh, in October uh, 2016, he joined Nanjing University as a full professor in the School of uh, Electronic Science and Technology. His recent research interests include the infrared optoelectronic devices and nanophotonics based on two dimensional materials. And recently, his group has a lot of uh, interesting results, including this uh, Hall effect and so on, the sensors. And today he will give us a talk on two-dimensional infrared sensors beyond the light intensity detection. Uh, welcome, Xiaomu. Now it's your stage. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Weibo, for the invitation and also for the introduction. For, uh, uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's my great pleasure today to, uh, to give a talk here uh, to share our recent work on the two-dimensional infrared sensors. Uh, so sorry, there's a uh, there's a mistake in the uh, in, in my uh, uh, in my biography. So this should be School of Electronic Science and Engineering. So sorry, this is a mistake. So uh, so today I would like to give a, a at first I would like to give a background a, a small a, a short introduction uh, about the motivation of my work. So uh, so. Uh, the study, the object, the object of our study is the infrared photo detector. So, what is mid infrared? So, mid infrared refers to the uh, spectral range with wavelengths from three to three uh, to thirty uh, micrometers. So, why this part is important or is interesting for or, uh, for us? Because at least uh, because there are two reasons. So, first, so this wavelength range. Uh, is coincide with the we, we, uh, we call the molecule oscillation uh, 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 spectrum. That is means that most of the molecules they have uh, the the, mo the molecular fingerprint uh, oscillation in this range. So the absorption in this range for each molecule will be strong, and especially we can identify the molecule uh, by their uh, spectral by their absorption spectrum in this range. And secondly, uh, this wavelength range contains two we call uh, a transparent window for the uh, 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 for the ast uh, atmosphere. So that means for the range of three to five micrometer and uh, eight to twelve micrometer, so the uh, uh, the uh, the light is transparency uh, in the uh, uh, atmosphere. So based on this. Fact uh, we can uh, we can have a lot of uh, uh, important applications such as free space communication or such as free space uh, quantum communication or sensing like this. So that's the mo the motivation of my study. So uh, for this uh, obviously for these applications the key component will be the uh, mid IR photo detectors or mid IR sensors. So this uh, this slide summarizes the uh, current uh, uh, the state of art mid infrared sensors, the performance of mid infrared uh, mid infrared sensors. We can see that there are two uh, features. Firstly, in the interesting range, in the range we are interesting, that means three to uh, maybe three uh, to thirty or three to twelve. So most of the detectors also the performance is approaches the limitation of photovoltaic or the limitation of photoconductive, but they are still far away from the um, visible sensors, visible cameras. For example, for silicon cameras, so if even for the room temperature, the detectivity or the signal to, uh, to noise ratio is easy to uh, reach 10 to 12 uh, joules. However, for the uh, MCT detector, maybe this is the uh, with the highest performance in the mid infrared range. It's still two others uh, worse. 
and uh, even worse for the uh, non cryogenic detectors for the room temperature detectors the performance is even worse so the uh, performance of today's mid infrared sensors are not satisfied in addition or more importantly the cost of mid infrared sensors are also very uh, uh, very challenging for, for application so there are three at least the three reasons first the growth of uh, mid infrared materials such as mct or quantum wire is very complex it costs for expensive process secondly it's the integration pr uh, process so for for example for the camera for the ir camera uh, because of we cannot integrate the we cannot grow the, ma the material directly on silicon uh, uh, on silicon chip or on silicon circuit so we need two chips to bond together that wafer bonding process uh, it's very uh, low yield and that's very expensive another reason this reason is also uh, overlooked but it's uh, but, but it's very important for the cost as a package so for most applications we need uh, uh, we don't need uh, we don't want to the uh, thermal loss or thermal conductive uh, due to the, uh, the the air or the uh, or, or some other gas, so we need vacuum package for the device. So that's also very expensive. And finally, uh, of course, the fabrication process will be uh, will be very high because of most of the fabrication process is CMOS incompatible due to the material we used. So taking all this factor together, the cost of mid-infrared sensors or cost of mid-infrared uh, the cost of mid-infrared uh, uh, modules are about uh, uh, three orders higher than that of invisible range even with smaller uh, pixels so that's the main challenging for the uh, mid-infrared sensors uh, based on uh, to circumvent or to or try to solve this challenging, we use uh, two-dimensional materials or two-dimensional materials as a promising candidate uh, for the IR sensor. So why? Because of as a part uh, as an engineer, we have two points uh, or, or or we have two interesting. Uh, we notice two interesting of uh, points of the two-dimensional materials. Firstly, the two-dimensional materials as a very rich uh, uh, family of materials. We have two dimensional insulator, two dimensional semiconductors, two dimensional uh, narrow band semiconductor, which is very good for uh, mid infrared application. And we also have mid, um, uh, two dimensional metal. So, in principle, we can build up a device fully on two dimensional materials. So, based on uh, uh, a consistent fabrication process so that will be very good for the uh, for to 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 uh to decrease the cost uh, so this slide uh, slide summarizes the uh, the 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 two two dimensional materials we can obtain from the market it's about uh, uh, maybe 100 or 200 types of two dimensional materials in the market in the shell and secondly the fabrication process. So first, uh, to uh, so most of the two-dimensional materials, the fa their fabrication process are same as compatible. So and also very important, we can integrate. We can fully integrate two-dimensional materials on, for example, silicon chips or other uh, or integrate with other materials. So that's a, a that's an important or crucial step for the low cost IR sensor. So based on this, this considerations, so we are very keen on uh, uh, develop or study the two dimensional material based IR sensors. So, uh, so this is a, a small background for my research. So today I would like to uh, talk about several important, I think at least in my opinion, <laughs> important progress in this field uh, I mean, in the two-dimensional uh, IR sensors. So, uh, since 2018, uh, sorry, 2016, my uh, I start uh, uh, I start a, 
a research group in Nanjing University. And uh, most of our research focus on the uh, IR sensors, but beyond simply the intensity detection. So because for an electric, a electromagnetic wave or for light, we have three uh, degree of freedom. That's the magnitude, the um, frequency, and the phase. So that corresponds to the three degree of freedom, three optical degree of freedoms of three optical parameters. So first, uh, in the classical view, there are intensity, there are polar, uh, light polarization and the light uh, uh, wavelengths. So in the viewpoint of in, in the quantum viewpoint, there are photon number, angular momentum, and uh, uh, photon energy of uh, of light. So that's the uh, that's the, uh, the, the 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 main uh, content I will talk today. So first, I would like to talk about the, the photon number uh, detect. So uh, as the light turns to weak. If we would like to uh, detect light, we need single photon detector, or we need to detect the photon in uh, light in single photon level. Traditionally, people use avalanche photodiode to uh, to achieve this goal. So, uh, achieve, uh, avalanche photodiode is just a pin junction. So the structure is very uh, uh, very, very simple: a p-type semiconductor and n-type semiconductor, which is moderately doped but not highly doped. So for the forward case, it's just a, re a rectification uh, uh, behavior. So that's uh, very common. And uh, for the reverse bias, if the doping level is, uh, is properly adjust, adjusted, we, have, uh, we will have an avalanche breakdown pheno phenomenon. So in this avalanche breakdown case, the electron, uh, the carrier, for example, the whole or electron, uh, will be highly uh, uh, will be highly interact with the uh, with the lattice under high electric field. So in this case, the errors can be uh, multiplied by the impact ionization process. So uh, that means uh, one electron uh, can interact with the lattice and uh, uh, ionize another electron uh, whole pair. And then the electron, the new electron hole pair was separated, and the, uh, by this way, the carrier is, uh, is, uh, is multiplicated. So through this way, uh, high gain can be uh, can be obtained uh, in the avalanche breakdown of pn junction. So and uh, based on this principle, uh, people developed a very good. Uh, uh, avalanche photodiode device. However, this device, I mean APD, faced two challenges, uh, faced two challenges in the uh, mid-infrared region. First, it, caused, uh, it requires high voltage be uh, because we need high voltage to uh, accelerate the electron or hole to uh, impact ionize the light eyes. Uh, secondly, the, this process is highly it's highly random, so we, we have very high noise in the avalanche process. So uh, how to avoid this, uh, these challenges? We need to solve the highly, uh, the, the high scattering in the uh, impact ionization process. But how to deal with scatter? Straightforward, a straightforward way is that we replace the channel we replace the draft transport channel where carriers are scattered to a ballistic ca transport channel. That means the carriers are almost unscattered or the carriers transport are highly coherent. Uh, so we are consider this, this principle for, for, for many years, for I think three years. So uh, how to achieve this or can we achieve this? Uh, so very, Fortunately, in 2016 or, uh, or in 2014, so in Feng Nianxia's group at Yale, so I, I, uh, I started to study a new material, black phosphorus. So this material is very interesting. They have very strong interlayer uh, coupling. Sorry, this should be interlayer coupling. I, I mean, the, uh, uh, coupled between 
uh, layer, layer structure is very strong. Therefore, it results in very high mobility in the out of plane, uh, out of plane direction. And secondly, the two dimensional materials we are easy to exfoliate it. Uh, we are very easy to get a very thin channel, vertically thin channel by the mechanical exfoliation process. So by this way, we can build up a very short channel. Combine these two, uh, these two factors, we can easily get the, uh, the, 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 the electron mean or the whole mean free pass is larger than the uh, channel length. So it's hopefully, uh, so, it's, it, so the ballistic transport can be achieved. And secondly, the uh, black phosphorus is a low band gap material. It's easy to build up a heterojunction. So in this case, we can apply a relative high voltage on the junction and to get the avalanche. So the first thing is to verify we can get ballistic avalanche in BP. So uh, to achieve this goal, we build up this kind of device, a vertical BP device. The BP channel is about 10 to 20 nanometers thick. And uh, we test the mobility. The mobility is good, uh, seems uh, doable. And uh, it, it, it was predicted uh, can be larger than the uh, channel length. So we perform low temperature uh, transport uh, measurement on this device, and we get this kind of quantum oscillation in this device. And uh, the quantum oscillation can be uh, adjusted to very good patterns. This pattern indicates that the electron uh, in the vertical direction, the transport is highly coherent. So the device, uh, the, the BP channel acts as an electron wave guy, and uh, the electron and the FP resonance gives this uh, oscillation. So by this method, we have verified that we can actually get the, uh, the ballistic transport in vertical BP channel. Next step is based on this uh, ballistic channel to build up a pin junction. So here we choose another two-dimensional uh, two materials, indium selenide, that's untapped, and uh, to, uh, to, to stack with the PTAP BP to build up a vertical uh, PN junction. And for this purpose, uh, for, this, uh, uh, for this study, we spend a lot of time to improve the uh, interface between these two materials. And finally, we get very clean interface. We can see that uh, the uh, lattice uh, of both of materials are, uh, are, uh, are clean, are clear. And also the interface is nearly perfect. So not surprising, in this kind of device, we get very good uh, avalanche uh, breakdown phenomenon. So this, this is the, the, the avalanche. And also because of we, the, uh, sorry, the thickness, the total thickness about 40 nanometer. So the electric field in this structure can be very strong and we can use very low threat, threshold voltage to trigger the avalanche. And uh, we also analyze the band structure. So, a big, uh, so we can say that uh, 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 the band bending as an interface is about uh, two um, milli UV. We can get two milli UV band bending. So, because of the band gap of black phosphorus is just about 0.3 UV. So, the band bending is enough, it's much larger than the 1.5 times of the band gap. And, uh, from a classical point of view, so uh, this condition is good enough to trigger the uh, to trigger the avalanche. And also, we have a back gate. We have a back gate. Oh, sorry, this structure. We have a back gate. We can use the back gate to adjust the doping level of these two materials. So actually, we can draw a a, a full phase diagram for the uh, uh, for the junction. And we can see that by, uh, by, uh, 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 by adjusting the doping level, we can actually switch the device, the breakdown from Zena or the avalanche, uh, or the, sorry, tunneling breakdown to avalanche breakdown. So that's in good, uh, uh, that agrees very well with the theory. And also, uh, this is the experimental result. We can see we can adjust the breakdown method. So, uh, here uh, we summarize the, uh, the, 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 the main finding. I mean, 
the break uh, the avalanche breakdown. Uh, so in this kind of device, that's a new kind of uh, ballistic avalanche. So that means because of the uh, carriers are ballistic transport in the BP channel, and the impact ionization occurs at the interface of uh, of this channel. Uh, it will result in very high gain because it's a highly deterministic manner uh, behavior. And we can got very low noise, low noise. So experimentally, we test this device by a full micrometer light. So we can see that actually, uh, this is a, the dark curve and this is uh, and the, the red curve is the light curve. We can uh, get very good uh, the uh, carrier multiplication or, uh, or carrier uh, gain uh, in this in this structure, the multiplication factor can be uh, as high as about uh, uh, 10 to 5. So we summarize the performance in the uh, red figure. So we can say that uh, the detection limit is about, uh, uh, in our case, in our case, is about 20 uh, kilowatt. However, the 20 kilowatt is not the limitation of our device, but the limitation of our instrument setup. So we cannot uh, uh, reliably get lower power of laser. So we cannot, uh, right now, we cannot determine the, uh, the, uh, the lower detection uh, limit of our device. This value is much slower, uh, it, it's much lower than the MCT detection limit, uh, which is commercially available. And also the noise. The noise is another uh, main challenge for the uh, avalanche photo dial because of the excess, uh, excessive noise is very high when avalanche occurs because of the random, uh, the random scattering. However, in our case, we uh, normalize the, uh, the this is the uh, uh, noise current, uh, uh, the current noise density spectrum. We normalize this spectrum and found that when avalanche occurs, the normalized noise is not increased, but it decreases because the because the uh, this is because the avalanche process, uh, the ballistic avalanche process, is where as a deterministic process, not a random process. So in this case, the uh, the noise is not increased, uh, and uh, the uh, if we normalize it, it it to the high current, it will decrease. So this is the first part about the. Uh, the, uh, uh, the the single photon detector. So right now, to give uh, to summarize, right now we can get very uh, low uh, detection limit as about uh, twenty photons in the linear mode, and a single photon in the uh, in the Geiger mode. Uh, so uh, this is the first work. And secondly, we are also very interested in other optical parameter. For example, the polarization. The polarization detector uh, will be also very interesting for the uh, for uh, for uh, for, uh, for, uh, for for practical application. For example, uh, uh, it can enhance the light, uh, enhance the image in the case of low signal background uh, ratio. Uh, for for example, in this uh, in this pictures, we can see that uh, the artificial uh, uh, the artificial objective. Objects, for example, the cars can be easily identified in the polarization image, but in the grayscale, we cannot hard to identify this kind of thing. Uh, how to characterize the polariz polarization? So we have uh, three, uh, actually four focus parameters to, uh, to fully describe this, uh, this, uh, this polarization. So we have uh, that three uh, parameters to, decre uh, to describe the linear and circular polarized and one parameter to, de uh, to describe the uh, intensity of the light. So uh, previously people always use some uh, filter or some other things to identify the polarization. So here in our, uh, in our group, we develop a method to use chiral plasmodic antenna to achieve this goal. Uh, that is, we fabricate some plasmodic antenna that is not identical to its mirror, that is the chiral plasmodic antenna. So this kind of 
material. Because of the unique structures, it, it, it interacts with light, um, uh, uh, it uh, non, uh, uh, symmetry, it, uh, symmetrically interact with light with different polarization uh, states. For example, so these two figures give the, 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 uh, the, the, the photo current uh, for the uh, chiral plasmonic antenna in different configurations. So this, uh, so this is the uh, left uh, circular case and this is right, uh, right circular case. And uh, so uh, the photo current obeys this formula. So uh, it uh, has a circular polarized uh, a term, a linear polarized term, and a constant term. So, uh, so sorry, this is uh, the, uh, the the experimental setup we, we by which we measure the, uh, the the full polarization photocurrent. So, if we combine if we combine full uh, full pixel together, that is the full, uh, uh, the full photo detector with different uh, uh, orientation of the antenna of the antenna, we can get four formulas. So in the four formulas, we have uh, uh, the same uh, the uh, the same responsivity but different phase. And uh, if we solve this uh, the equation together, we solve this four equation together, we can easily um, simultaneously obtain the four uh, Stokes parameters. I mean the three uh, the three polarization parameters and also the intensity parameter. So by this method, actually we test the ability of our device, and uh, we use wave, wave plate, a combination of half wave plate and a quarter wave plate, to make the uh, the Stokes parameter to make the polarization state uh, go around at the surface of a Poincaré uh, sphere. And then to use our uh, photo detector uh, to detect the light and to extract the uh, polarization state by this method. And uh, we have very good results. It means that the extraction uh, result agrees very well with the real state of the, of the real polarization state of the light. So by this method, by this new method, we can, use, uh, we can get very good results for the polarization IR sensor. So right now, uh, uh, it, it's a routine way for the plasmonic if they, uh, if they are similar with the uh, nanophotonics. So this, is, uh, uh, so, so this is very common or very uh, routine for the plasmonics. However, another interesting point is that if we can uh, adjust the spin angular momentum of photon, or the that it to the uh, polarization state of the photon. Uh, the, the photo. If we can adjust this state, we can use it to adjust the valetronic degree of, of freedom in two dimensional materials. For example, TMDC materials. So in TMDC materials, because of the spin optical coupling, so the spin uh, there's there's another degree of freedom which can carry information that we call it valley tonic, uh, we call it valley degree of freedom or pseudo spin. So because by this uh, asymmetric uh, photo, uh, uh, asymmetric plasmonic antenna, we can selectively uh, sense the light with different polarization state. We can also use it to combine it with the TMDC material to selective uh, inject uh, uh, valley carriers and then to use valley carrier as an information carrier to operate uh, the, uh, the info, uh, to achieve the information operation such as switch operation. So this is the uh, the uh, for the prototype device what we uh, what uh, what we fabricated a TMDC channel. And decorated with the uh, uh, chiral, uh, uh, the chiral plasmonic antenna, and at the two, uh, at the two electrode for a uh, drain and source, we can use uh, the hot carrier to inject the uh, uh, very polarized carriers into the channel, and, and then 
instead of a uh, direct current output, we use very whole. Uh, we we uh, we use two very whole electrodes to generate uh, to generate the output by means of very whole effect. So firstly, we test the pro uh, prototypical uh, device by testing the very whole effect. So this is the uh, the the very whole mapping uh, of the of our device. That means we use a laser that. Uh, scan in the in the device and simultaneously measure the two uh, the the the, uh, the this the voltage between these two uh, whole whole electrodes as a as an output and we can see that if we pack the laser around the drain or source electrode because of the hot carrier injection uh, process we can get a uh, very whole output. Otherwise, we put laser in other place, we cannot get this signal. So, uh, we, so by this method, we can verify that we can firstly inject the valley carrier and secondly detect it by valley hole effect. And also to work as a switch, another, uh, another function is switching this, this, this or control the the signal strength of the output. So we test. Uh, actually, we test the uh, the the the, uh, the 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 valley. Sorry, the valley hole output as a function of the gate voltage. So we can say that because we can uh, adjust the carrier injection by gate voltage. So we can also uh, adjust the or modulate the output by the gate voltage. So not surprisingly, we get a. Uh, very good off ratio by the uh, uh, by this by this method. So we can see that because of we use uh, we use the valley current, but not uh, not charge current. So we don't need any bias voltage in the drain and soft uh, direction. And we directly pack light here and test the output whole voltage as a gate uh, as a function of gate voltage. And the off ratio can be reached one hundred even without any bias voltage. Uh, so by this method, we can achieve a valetronic transistor, but not, uh, not only a, a polarization detection, but a valetronic transistor. So the, the third part of, of our study is the, about the spectrometers, the on-chip spectrometers. So in, in addition to the polarization, they're also very interesting in the uh, uh, in the spectrum of mid infra infrared light, as aforementioned, as as uh, as mentioned in the beginning of this talk, because uh, the spectrum of mid infrared light uh, infrared light can provide a lot of information about chemical uh, about the chemical information. Traditionally, spectrometers can be achieved by two ways. Firstly. As by some uh, as by dispersive components to split light into multiple channels and use a detector array to detect each channel and then combine them together to get the uh, spectrum. Another way is by interferometer. For example, this is the typical uh, outline of an FTR of uh, FTR device for your transform infrared spectrometer. So. Uh, by an uh, interferometer, we can modulate the light in the time domain and then to sample the, time, uh, the, 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 the output signal in different time and uh, use uh, inverse Fourier transform to obtain the uh, spectrum information. For on-chip application or for on-chip implementation, so, there are, so we have always four ways to achieve these two goals. Uh, by either a Fourier transform or dispersive optics narrowband filters or reconstructive ways. So here I don't want to put uh, much uh, uh, much time on on the details of these two uh, these four ways, which uh, but I would like to uh, focus on this way reconstructive method. So that a newly that that a new emerging that's an emerging uh, method. Uh, which was recently uh, reported. Uh, 
a lot of people, uh, a, a lot of ways can uh, can uh, can have fit this this method, this general method. So let's uh, discuss it. Uh, use the single nanowire spectrometer as an example. So here, a single nanowire, uh, which is a, 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 a alloy, it means that it's a, a CDSE and the CDS, uh, I mean, uh, it's a, a claw, I, I think it's, it's, sorry, I cannot pronounce the, uh, the chemical, the, uh, the chemical composition of these materials. So it's, uh, so the, uh, uh, the chemical composition of this nanowire is gradually modulated during the growth. So that's the band gap of this, uh, this nanowire wire is, is spatially changed. Uh, so here, the, uh, the band gap is, uh, uh, is very large and here the, the band gap is, is smaller and it gradually changes along the nanowire. So by this method, you can build up a detector array based on the nanowire. And an input light can be uh, differently absorbed and produce the, uh, uh, the, the output photo current on each point. So for example, we test the, uh, uh, the band gap. Uh, this is the, P, uh, the PL image of this, uh, of this nanowire. And this is the absorption of this nanowire. So, uh, and we also test the photo current spectrum, that is the photo current uh, to different uh, uh, wavelengths of, of each device for D1 to D8, for D1 to D8 uh, for this device. And then by this method, we can get a matrix. We call this, we call this matrix uh, as a, a responsive matrix. So that means the photo current will be the matrix uh, multiple the, the, the the spectrum, and uh, if we model the problem as this, so the goal is to uh, is to extract the spectrometer from the uh, from the measured photo current uh, by the aid of the responsive uh, by the responsivity matrix. So this is a typical inverse problem. Uh, so this is a very po popular problem for computer science, I think. Uh, so it's compressive sensing. Uh, it uh, starts, it even starts a topic uh, uh, called compressive sensing. So the algorithm, we have a lot of algorithms to solve this problem to re or to reconstruct, reconstruct the, the spectrum. So if you are interested, you can find a lot of uh, literature. Uh, However, I would like to point for most of the, uh, the this kind of reconstructive uh, spectrometer, there is a problem. We need a photo detector array. We need a photo detector array. Even for a single photo detector, for a single mid infrared photo detector, that's very difficult. To build up a, an array is very challenging. And uh, also, Another point is uh, another concern, uh, performance concern is this. So here we have, uh, if we want to get uh, end points of the spectrometer, we need uh, end points of current uh, photo current sampling or for end point photo current samples. So if we want to have a high resolution, the photo current will be very uh, will will be uh, the number of photo current will be very high, and also the responsivity uh, matrix will be very high. Then the 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 the, the computing amount the com the computation of this method will be exponentially increased uh, by the uh, with the with the resolution. So in this case, it's hard to get very high resolution. Also, there are a lot of uh, work to, 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 to claim they can get very good uh, resolution by this method. But unfortunately, I have to say, today we cannot get, uh, get resolution such as uh, one nanometer or one centimeter inverse in wave number 
uh, for this uh, for this measure. So, is is there any method to get a, a get a spectrum with just one photo detector, or without a photo detector array? So, that or uh, uh, that's our research interesting. So, we take this method. Again, we use black phosphorus. So for black phosphorus, because the interlayer coupling is very uh, is very strong, if uh, if we use double gate to use an uh, electrical displacement or use uh, an electric field to adjust the the, ver the vertical interaction, we can dynamically control the band gap of this material. So for example, we build up a double gate, a dual gate BP device, and measure the photo current, and we find that. If we use the double gate to increase the displacement uh, to, uh, uh, to, to adjust the, the, the displacement, the on-off ratio of the device, so this is the transport on-off ratio of the device dramatically change. And also we measure the photo current spectrum. That's the, uh, this is the wavelength and this is the photo current number. So if we increase the, the, uh, the displacement, the band gap shrinks and the uh, response uh, uh, emerges for the uh, high wavelength path. So again, if we use this this device and use un, uh, uh, use unsampled uh, unsampled uh, uns, unsampled of the photo current, we can again use this method to uh, extract the spectrometer. So by this method, we can solve the detect array problem. However, the reconstruction, the, uh, the, 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 the nature problem of the, the reconstructive method or is still there. That is, for, for example, uh, if, a, if there's a small change in the spectrometer or if a, there's a small change in the photo current, due to this is a global, uh, due, uh, due Due to this is a global uh, relationship between the photo current and the, the spectrometer. Even a, a small change in one element, either in I or in S, we need to recalculate the uh, the problem again and to deduce the uh, to deduce the spectrum. It's the spectrum, the spectrum. So this is actually physical. Uh, irrational, and also even worse for most of the responsivity metrics, the norm, the, the norm of the response uh, responsivity metric is, is very large. It means that this inverse problem is an unstable problem. We can't uh, uh, the, the the device cannot uh, 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 cannot. Uh, cannot deal with large noise. So for example, if we add a small amount of noise into the, pho the photo current, we can see that it totally ruined the reconstruction and the result in very wrong spectrometer. So how to deal with this? So fortunately, black phosphorus gave us another chance by excitonic response to deal with this problem. So uh, by to further uh, uh, improve, optimize the fabrication process, we can get, uh, as aforementioned, we can get very clean interface, get very clean device. And in very clean device, if they, uh, we, we, we carefully or, or we finally measure the photo response, we can see that we can get two responses part. First, from the, this part or this part from the, the, uh, from the band edge, this band edge absorption and band edge photo current. And also we can get another small peak. This is a cytonic response. And, all, and the response, the excitonic response can be also modulated by stack effect or by the displacement of the, uh, of, uh, by, the electrical, uh, by the electric displacement. And we test the differential, uh, and we test the, uh, the cytonic response uh, because the, uh, while the band edge shift under electric field is very small and very small, smooth, uh, if we, we test the relative 
a change, it's almost zero. However, the relative change of the excitonic response is very large. Because of the electric field, field cannot uh, uh, not only adjust the, uh, uh, the optical band gap or the peak energy of the exciton, it also adjusts the exciton population because the electric field can dissolve exciton. The, the, this double uh, interaction, light matter interaction, results in the excitonic response is very sensitive to the change of uh, displacement, electrical di the electric displacement. So actually, we get a dirt-like uh, response uh, response matrix for the uh, for the current uh, uh, for the for the differential current. That means if we uh, if we uh, we 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 manners, uh, we manners, we, uh, so so the the differential current is defined as uh, as defined as this. So I n manners I n manners one. So that's the differential manners. It stands for that the uh, uh, the relative change of the photo current um, to uh, as a function of the uh, electric field. So by this method, we can get a dirt like responsivity matrix. So if this matrix turns to a diagonal matrix, so it's very easy to, uh, to, to, to solve S by I. You just need to, 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 uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to over, to extract over the, 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 the response value, and then, you, uh, and then you can get the spectrum. And the, this relationship is one by one. This is a one-to-one -one rela uh, corresponding relationship. So by this method, we can local extract any, uh, uh, any uh, uh, we can extract the local spectrum at any wavelength. So experimentally, we actually get very good, very high-profile resolved on chip spectral scoping. So this is the, the result which we measured for the moisture or for the uh, water vapor. So we can see that uh, the best uh, resolution is about a full uh, centimeter, uh, it's about a full centimeter reverse in this number, it's about two nanometer in uh, wavelength. So to best of our knowledge, so this is the, the uh, uh, the, the best result we can achieve for on chip photo uh, for on chip spectroscopy today. So uh, that's the main reason. Uh, that's the main part of our, uh, of of my talk. Uh, to summarize, so we have uh, uh, we have used uh, two dimensional materials to build up a lot of uh, photo detectors, uh, which can uh, sense uh, multiple. Uh, optical parameters beyond the, light, the simple light intensity uh, for the practical application. So, and finally, I would like to uh, thank my collaborators, my group members, and also my founders. And thank you for, uh, for, 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 uh, for attending this talk, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Xiaomu, for the very nice uh, talk. Um, so I just start the questions. Okay, so later on, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. And so the, for the first part for this uh, black first first, uh, yeah. uh, what's the wavelength range for this kind of detector? What's the okay. band? Uh, mm. uh, sorry. So the band gap of the Black phosphorus is about 0 0.3 EV. So it actually covers from the visible to 4.3 nanometer, uh, micrometer, 4.3 micrometer. I see. So it can even go to uh, uh, visible, right? So then uh, uh, you can directly compare with the silicon detectors uh, in the visible uh, range. Yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, so that's a very good question. So I have to to say today, so this is only only my own opinion. So, uh, for two dimensional materials, you cannot compete with the silicon. You cannot compete with silicon. What's the reason for this? Uh, for the reason is 
the cost. I think most of, uh, important is the cost. Now for silicon, it's very cheap. It's easy to get very high results for the visible rank. So it's already good enough for visible rank, right? So of course we can use two dimensional materials. We use two dimensional materials to get better, maybe better uh, results. But, uh, of, uh, but definitely we need much more cost. The cost of the, uh, the sample growth the cost, the cost of uh, integration. Uh, for silicon, for example, if you, uh, if you uh, just uh, uh, use a, 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 a TE crude cryogenic uh, uh, instrument, you can get very, uh, already very high result, 10 to 13 uh, joules. So to best of my knowledge, for two-dimensional materials, invisible range, maybe you can get 10 to, 10 to 15, so that's the reported best results, 10 to 15. But uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the, the pixel size, the, the cost and so on, and the technical uh, complexity uh, like this, so it's hard to, com to compete silicon. It's hard to compete silicon, I have to say. Mm. But you also, but uh, without considering the cost, let's say just in physics, Right, so, so you didn't, you mentioned that you can detect uh, with a limit of 20 photons somewhere in your- Yeah, uh, yeah in, the, in, the full, in the full, uh, in the full micrometer range. So that's better than the uh, MCT detector. I see, but in the visible, you can go to uh, single photon detectors? Uh, yeah, but in the visible, silicon can get single photon detectors. Yeah, but uh, Y2D cannot, or what's the limitation oh. there? No, no limitation for sure we can get we can get but uh, I just say the competition in terms of practical in, uh, in terms of practical application not in in physics I, I mean yeah oh okay um okay and other questions from the participants David you have other questions so Yes, I have a question, but I was waiting if somebody has asked a question <laughs> as well. <laughs> so uh, for, for the last part, uh, it's very interesting, you, the, the idea of reconstruction of the spectrum. I mean, so you, I mean, you, you give some kind of figure of merit in terms of sensitivity, uh, wavelength sensitivity, which is two nanometer, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yes uh, okay. I was wondering, I mean, so if you compare this to other, uh, to the current state of the art, uh, are, are you better or not too far? So that's that will be my first question. My second question, still related to this problem, is uh, uh, in terms of of speed. Also, maybe uh, uh, in your case, you may have something which is much faster than than the usual uh, devices. Is it correct? Or? Okay, thank you. That's very very good question. So, firstly, I would like to answer about the resolution. So. Uh, for the large, in, large instrument, I mean, not on chip spectrometer, for the uh, maybe bulky uh, spectroscopy, maybe for FTR, uh, today the commercially, ava the commercially available, uh, the best value is the, for the resolution is about uh, 0. Point something, 0. 0.4 or 0. 0.6 uh, centimeter inverse. Uh, but for the on chip application, that's much worse. So uh, before our work, I think. I think no better than no better than ten centimeter uh, centimeter uh, inverse. That's uh, that's the value. If I was not wrong, yeah, I think so. I see. So you're so, a factor of five better in that case, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Five better for on chip uh, for on chip application. So that's the first thing. And secondly, very good question for the dynamical. Uh, I mean the uh, the the temporal uh, measurement of the spectrometer. For example, measure the moisture change or mo or, 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 or evaporate of some other gas. Yeah. Actually, we are doing this. We are doing this now. So, and we get some uh, some preliminary result. I didn't uh, put it here. So, it's about the uh, the evaporate of acetone. We can measure the process, the whole process, in terms of uh, about zero point two. Um, micrometer per uh, per spectrometer. Uh, sorry, microsecond, 0 0.2 microsecond per spectrometer, yeah. I see. So you are almost fully limited somehow, right? 
uh, I think so. I hope, hope, hope so. So the story is very, uh, is very long. So this method, I mean, to use the stuck effect of black phosphorus single photo detector. So uh, we did it uh, since I think uh, two years ago. But unfortunately, this this May, uh, this May, yeah, this May. So my previous supervisor, Professor Feng Yanxia at Yale University, published a paper in Nature Photonics, just the same concept. So unfortunately, I, I was scooped from this field. Yeah. <laughs> but but he just used this method, uh, solve the inverse inverse problem, and use the bandage uh, the bandage uh, 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 response, and also his resolution is very worse, about 40 nanometer or 20 nanometer like this, yeah. And cannot do the uh, dynamical, I mean the temporal dynamical uh, spectrum. So, 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 uh, anyway, so we are very slow in this field and uh, we have the risk to scoop, to be scooped out of this field, yeah. Mm, but uh, much better result. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay, but that, that's very nice. That's very, very nice for that. Yes. yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I have another question for the second part for this uh, value transistors. Uh, so in value transistors, you have uh, this figure for the this uh, hall voltage versus this uh, this uh, drain and source voltage, right? If yes. The, uh, yes, yes, last, yes. last slide, maybe, last. Uh, this one? Yeah, yes, uh, yes. So VDS and versus VH. So yes. then uh, in the next, uh, so basically when VDS is zero, it means that the whole voltage is roughly zero, right? Should be uh, zero. Actually here, yeah, actually here, we can see that <laughs> uh, I didn't uh, um, uh, enlarge here, but if we enlarge the signal here, it's not zero. It's not zero because of there is a, a uh, so let me uh, let me explain a little. So the source string the the, the, the role played by the source string uh, source string voltage because we want to uh, provide a, an electric field. The electric field is used to uh, uh, propel the valley current, and the, the larger the electric field, the larger the valley uh, the larger the valley uh, the, the, the the valley hole effect. It's like this. Yes. So the electric field provide a velocity, provide a velocity. Yeah. But even without this one, without if the velocity is zero, we can still have a have a valley have a valley hole voltage. But it's very small because the velocity is provided by the uh, provided by the uh, built-in electric field of the of the source and the drain uh, electrode. I so see. that's why even without the the, 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 the the external electric field, we can still get some signal because of the built-in uh, field. I see. So then in the next slide, you are switching this one, right? You are specifically yes. using yes. the back gate to yes. switch this uh, small signal when this uh, VDS yes, yes. is zero. Yes. But if you provide a voltage, the signal it will be much better. For example, the arm ratio can be easily reach uh, 10 to 4. 10 to uh, 10,000, yeah. for example, one volt VDS. Yeah. Near uh, approaches, not uh, approaches, approaches 10 to 4, I think so. Yeah, yeah but uh, why did you demonstrate uh, VDS equals zero for the energy saving? Oh. Uh, yeah, for the energy saving purpose, yeah. OK, thanks, thanks. OK, any other questions from the participants, audience? Feel free to ask because we. Uh, okay, normally our students are shy, you know, same as. Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yes, they are shy. Same as in my group, yeah. <laughs> okay, so if uh, no uh, other questions, uh, let's thank Professor Wang Xiaomu again. Uh, thank you for this time, it's really perfect. It's one now. <laughs> yeah, thank you thank so you. much. Yeah. Very a nice. great pleasure. Yeah, hope we can uh, we can have collaboration work together soon. Okay. Yeah. Keep in yeah. touch. Yes. Keep in touch. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a nice. Uh, Thank you very day. much. Okay. I hope to see you in Singapore one day. Soon. <laughs> bye bye. bye. Thank you. See you. Bye 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 bye. bye. bye.